Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. In my last lecture, I was discussing about uh, the ionization energy or ionization enthalpy and how one can correlate their values by simply looking to the electronic configuration and the effective nuclear charge. So, here I made an attempt to compare the ionization energies or ionization enthalpies of uh, potassium and aluminum. Now, let us uh, continue discussing more about uh, these periodic properties. Uh, that means, uh, this ionization energy gives lot of information about nature of the bond type whether it is ionic or covalent and by knowing this chemical and physical properties of the substances can be predicted very easily. And ionization energy refers to the loss of an electron from the gaseous atom or an ion. I will repeat again ionization energy or ionization enthalpy refers to the loss of an electron from the gaseous atom or an ion. Ionization energy decreases down a group, increases along a period. One, one can compare charge to size ratio in this case. Okay. So, that means the ionization energy decreases down a group and increases along a period that is very important one should remember this one. And electronegativity refers to the tendency of an atom in a molecule to attract electron to itself. I repeat again electronegativity refers to the tendency of an atom in a molecule to attract electron to itself. The most widely used scale is divisor by Linus Pauling and it is also called Linus Pauling method and it is based on essentially the bond energies. The most electronegative elements are in the top right of the periodic table with fluorine being the most electronegative with a maximum value of 4.0 on the Pauling scale. So, among all the elements present in the periodic table, the fluorine is the most electronegative element with a value of 4.0 and the next one is oxygen having 3.5 and next we get chlorine about 3.1 and nitrogen comes very close to it 3.04 and continues. And of course, uh, electronegativity is a very useful general parameter for predicting the general chemical behavior of an element and it gives a very good indication of bond types. Just by simply looking into the electronegativity of two atoms that are combined to make a bond, we can simply predict the nature of that chemical bond. Two elements with a large electronegativity difference will tend to form ionic compounds. For example, halides with group 1 and 2 elements form ionic salts for example, NaCl and smaller electronegativity differences are enough when one of the elements is a highly electropositive metal again group 1 or group 2 element I am considering. Two elements with similar or intermediate electronegativities that is 2.5 approximately will tend to form covalent bonds example CH bond in case of methane. So, let us look into the variation of electronegativity through periodic table. So, this uh, very nicely uh, shows the trends in the electronegativity you can see here uh, the upper right corner elements in the periodic table shows very high electronegativity and of course, neon shows maximum and then helium comes we can ignore because we can never use them to make any compounds. And if you leave those two the most electronegative element is fluorine then oxygen comes and then as I mentioned chlorine comes and nitrogen comes again argon has little higher value compared to chlorine again. Uh, argon uh, it is very inert, so we can ignore. Uh, we have to consider only these remaining elements uh, and we can see the trends. These trends gives lot of information as I said and whereas in case of alkali metals, uh, hydrogen shows maximum of 2.1 and then we have 
beryllium and then magnesium and, and of course cesium has the least electronegativity value among all elements in the periodic table. Similarly, we can also look into the variation in the ionization energy uh, through all the elements in the periodic table. Uh, uh, here ionization energy refers to the first ionization energy and again here uh, it's, it follows almost the same trend we observed in case of electronegativity, not much uh, significant difference is there. And I have given a plot here to just get a idea about the relative ionization energies of uh, first row elements. You can see in case of helium, uh, it, it is very high and then it steadily drops and then lithium has the lowest value and then when we go to beryllium, it increases here. Of course, uh, here the nuclear charge is also increasing. Interestingly, in case of boron, despite increase in nuclear charge, atomic number it drops here and the same type of uh, uh, kink we can also see in case of aluminum. And another place where we observe this anomaly is in case of uh, oxygen and sulfur. We can explain again based on their electronic configuration simply just by looking to the electronic configuration of beryllium, two electrons are there here and uh, uh, it is a completely filled uh, valence shell. So, dislodge an electron from this one requires little higher energy as a result ionization energy of beryllium is first ionization energy is very high. In case of boron essentially although there is an increase in the atomic number essentially you have to remove the electron from the p orbital which is little far from the nucleus as a result its uh, first ionization energy drops and there is a steady increase is there. What is surprising is the lower ionization energy of oxygen compared to nitrogen despite it is being more electronegative. The reason is very simple, we can simply compare the electronic configuration of nitrogen and oxygen. We have a half field electronic configuration in case of nitrogen whereas in case of oxygen we have S2P4 that means one more than half field electronic configuration is there. That means by losing one electron oxygen can attain half field electronic configuration status to add some stability as a result what happens? the removal of one electron from oxygen is much more easier compared to removal of an electron from the half field electronic configuration of nitrogen. And same explanation one can give between phosphorus and sulfur and the trends uh, you can see it can be nicely explained uh, again by looking into the electronic configuration without any problem. Okay. So, I have again plotted, I have shown per comparison the first and second ionization energies. Again the trends are very similar. Again in case of oxygen and nitrogen, now the second ionization energy of oxygen is very high compared to nitrogen. It is expected because oxygen being much more um, having more uh, effective nuclear charge that is anticipated here. And here electronegativity values I have given on Pauling scale main group elements here and in case of fluorine it is uh, 4 whereas in case of chlorine it is 3.16, in case of oxygen it's, it is 3.44 and in case of nitrogen it is 3.04 and carbon has 2.55 value. It is more uh, higher than that of hydrogen 2.20 and also first electron attachment enthalpy also I have given for halogens. For fluorine it is minus 322 and in case of chlorine it is 349 and bromine it is 325 and iodine in is minus 295. So what is interesting is uh, why fluorine has low electron affinity compared to chlorine despite being the most electronegative element in the periodic table. Of course, the, if you just look into the size of fluorine atom it is very small when it takes another electron to complete its octet, the interelectronic repulsion will destabilize F ions as a result uh, it can readily lose an electron. In contrast chlorine being a bigger in atomic size what happens it can accommodate comfortably electron taken to make it a chloride anion. So that is the reason that chlorine shows more electron affinity compared to fluorine. So, this chart shows the relative atomic size of all the elements in the periodic table. You can see clearly 
in a group the uh, atomic size increases and along a period atomic size decreases that you can see that means in any given group the last element will be having higher size and, and in, in the if you consider any period first element will be larger in size and that is going to be always alkali metal and then the next one is alkaline earth metal and always the last ones being inert gas or inert gas elements. So, they are much smaller in size and these trends one should remember. What one should remember is the electronic configuration and then the relative atomic size. And once you know the relative atomic size and electronic configuration, understanding their ionization energy, electronegativity, electron affinity would be very easy and hence the prediction of their physical and chemical properties would be very much easier. And also one can make comparison of main group compounds no matter which atoms you are considering. When we look into the periodic table, okay, we have some metals and we have some non-metals and then in a period the non-metallic character increases and similarly in a group metallic property increases. Okay. That means the main group elements can be roughly classified as metals with an electronegativity less than 2 and as non-metals with electronegativity greater than 2.2. Those which have electronegativity value more than 2.2 are essentially non-metals all are in the right side of the periodic table and in case of uh, metals the alkali metals and alkaline earth metals and some of the heavier elements in each group are essentially having metallic properties. And this chart shown here represents the variation in the metallic character throughout the periodic table. You can see those elements which are marked in grey are essentially having metallic properties and those with uh, greyish yellow are essentially called as metalloids and those which are marked in yellow color are essentially non-metals. You can see clearly the right portion of most of the non-metals are situated and in between elements such as boron and silicon are metalloids and of course this metalloid property is also extended in case of germanium, arsenic and also antimony. So, the change in the properties uh, can be nicely understood just by looking at the first long period starting from sodium to argon, sodium and magnesium are both electropositive metals having 1 and 2 electrons in their valence shell. The next element is aluminum is a metal but shows several characteristics of non-metals in forming many covalent compounds. When you go to the group 14, silicon that means we have carbon the next one is silicon is a metalloid being a semiconductor and has compounds which show characteristics of both metal and non-metal compounds. And group 15 phosphorus onwards are truly non-metals. Phosphorus exists in several elemental forms all of which contain covalent PP bonds. Phosphorus is a true non-metal and rest of the elements are having some variable metallic properties. And of course, in case of phosphorus all allotropes have covalent PP bond whether you consider white phosphorus, red phosphorus or black phosphorus. Of course, we can learn more details when we go to group 15 elements. In case of group 16 and 17, sulphur and chlorine are truly non-metals. Sulphur exists as mainly covalent SCI rings. Also in other several forms, uh, sulphur is known to exist and show allotropes. And chlorine forms diatomic covalently bonded molecules. Argon exists as a monoatomic gas under ambient conditions and does not participate in chemical bonding owing to its filled valence shell and very high ionization energy. And going down in any of the main groups, elements become more metallic in character that I had already told you. This is paralleled by a decrease in electronegativity. Because electronegativity is decreasing, non-metallic properties decreasing and metallic properties increasing. And P block is the only part of the periodic table to contain non-metallic elements. I showed you in, in uh, one of the previous slides, if you see the non-metals they are always in the right side of the periodic table. And of course, when you talk about metals, metals are very good conductors of heat and electricity and in solid metals the electrons are 
extensively delocalized over the whole material. It appears as if we have a flow of electrons on the surface of the metal and because of this one all these metallic properties comes into picture. Non-metallic elements are insulators and have delocalizing bonding instead being formed from localized covalent bonds. In the center of P block there are so called metalloid elements such as boron and silicon the true metalloids. Of course, I showed you other few elements which also show metalloid properties. However, uh, these boron and silicon which show intermediate electronegativity values and also show relatively low electrical conductivity compared to metals but increases with temperature. The main group elements and their chemical compounds cover a wide range of bonding types from ionic through polymeric to molecular. The general features of the chemistry of main group elements and their selected compounds can be understood, analyzed and rationalized by using the variation in electronegativity of the elements as a very useful qualitative tool. So, that means uh, if you look into now the main group elements, we have a total of 42 elements with a vast number of chemical compounds and that is the reason uh, students often think that inorganic chemistry is highly complicated and it is very difficult, lot of things are there to remember. However, if you find a method to classify all the compounds of main group elements into some class and if we do systematic study understanding of the chemistry of main group elements would be rather easier. Keeping this in mind, in my lecture series I have classified all main group element compounds into simply three categories. Another fourth category also comes that I will elaborate later. These three categories are essentially the interaction of all main group elements with hydrogen or hydrogen sources to form hydrates and then reacting all main group elements with oxygen to form oxides and then reacting all main group elements with halogens to form halides or in particular chlorides which illustrate the general features very well. So, once if we do this kind of classification understanding their properties comparing with the neighboring groups and within the group will be very easy and hence we can understand and remember all these properties without much complications. So, let us look into the first type of compound that is hydrates of the elements. The hydrogen reacts with most of the elements to form hydrates and again these hydrates can be classified as molecular hydrates, saline or ionic hydrates, metallic hydrates and also intermediate hydrates. What are those classes? The saline hydrates are formed by the electropositive elements of group 1 and group 2 elements with an exception of beryllium. In case of beryllium when it forms hydrate it has some covalent character. So, other than that most of them are highly ionic hydrates. Hydrates of group 13 to 17 that is electronegative elements are essentially covalent in nature and for example, uh, if we look into diborane B2H6, aluminum hydride AlH3, methane CH4, NH3, H2O and HF they are all. So, they are all covalent species and whereas aluminum hydride is polymeric and rest of them are having covalent or polar covalent bonds. So, generally saline hydrates are ionic solids with high melting points. The group 1 and 2 elements are less electronegative than hydrogen. For example, if you take sodium has 0.9 and hydrogen has 2.1. So, the bondings are essentially ionic and the composition is simply MH. These hydrates react violently with water generating hideous gas and non-stoichiometric metallic hydrates are formed by all D block as well as F block elements. They are also essentially called as interstitial hydrates because when metals are reacted with hydrogen, this hydrogen goes and sits in the interstitial spaces to form non-stoichiometric metallic hydrates. And here this uh, chart shows the nature of the uh, may, hydrates of all the elements in the periodic table. You can see some of the ionic ones are shown here saline and the intermediate properties are ionic hydrates with covalent properties are shown in case of beryllium and magnesium and, and here they are truly metallic hydrates and of course, copper and zinc also shows uh, uh, intermediate properties 
whereas the rest of the elements in the p block are essentially molecular or covalent hydrides. So, for beryllium and boron the electronegativity difference with hydrogen is very small, beryllium hydride is covalent and boron hydrides are also form covalent compounds and as well as covalent clusters. Of course, we have in numerous examples of boron hydrides both neutral cationic and anionic all these uh, boron hydrides uh, we shall discuss when you go to group 13. In case of group 14 the hydrides are covalent molecular species a typical of having methane type structure. Similarly, group 15, 16 and 17 elements hydrides are all covalent molecular species and the acidity of these hydrides in aqueous solution increases on moving from left to the right of the periodic table as the electronegativity difference between H and the element increases the HX bond especially in case of halides becomes more polarized and it will be like delta plus on H and delta minus on X. So, this has influence on the physical properties such as boiling points and other things again we shall learn more about those things uh, when we go to the respective groups. Okay. So, now uh, a small question is there predict the properties of the hydrates formed by elements with electronegativities 0.9 and 3.5 and of course, the, the electronegativity of hydrogen is around 2.1 and it has to combine with two elements given here with atomic with electronegativity 0.9 and 3.5 and of course, uh, if you look into the, the first one uh, it has to be a metal of course, it is sodium it will probably form ionic hydride which will readily react with water giving hydrogen and a basic solution of the hydroxide that is sodium hydroxide. In case of second one 3.5 it is a non metal and the hydride will be a covalent uh, with a polar bond where H will carry plus charge and the other element with 3.5 essentially here chlorine it is it will carry Cl minus uh, it is 3.0. So, it will carry a negative charge. So, these compounds of uh, higher electronegativity will dissolve in water probably giving a neutral acidic solution. So, let us look into the oxides of the element uh, generally metals form basic oxides whereas, non metals form acidic oxides that means when you take a alkali metal or alkaline earth metal oxide and react with water they give the, the corresponding hydroxides whereas, non metal uh, are acidic and when they react with water they form the corresponding acids. Uh, the elements form normal oxides, peroxides, superoxides, suboxides and also non stoichiometric oxides as well. Okay. So, again uh, how the acid properties are increasing or decreasing are shown uh, in this chart here and acid properties are increasing in a period and decreasing in a group. So, group wise decreases and period wise it increases these trends also very easy to remember. If you remember just represented examples from S block as well as P block uh, and the high reactivity and high electronegativity of oxygen leads to the formation of a large number of binary oxygen compounds and many of them show high oxidate in the second element. So, that means oxygen the second most electronegative element in the periodic table and for the same reason most of the elements do form very stable oxides and metals typically form basic oxides as the electropositive metal readily forms a cation and the oxide anion abstract a proton to form water the example is shown here barium oxide reacts with water to give barium hydroxide. And in contrast non metals form acidic oxides the electronegative element pulls the electrons from the coordinated water molecule liberating H plus. For example, SO3 when it reacts with water it forms sulfuric acid H2SO4. For main group oxides there is a similar trend from ionic oxides for the bottom left elements through polymeric oxides in the center to molecular covalent oxides for the elements of higher electronegativity on the right side of the p block. So, that means, now you can see the trends simply by looking into the electronegativity 
and the electronic configuration of these elements. For example, if you take sodium oxide or calcium oxide which are basic oxides with water they give alkali solutions. I will show you here. So, this indicates uh, metal oxides, alkali metal and alkaline earth metal oxides are basic in nature. In contrast, if you simply take SO3 and water, it forms H2SO4. That means, main group P block oxides are essentially acidic or S block elements are essentially basic in nature. So, if you look into group 13 oxides such as B2O3 and Al2O3 are polymeric and Al2O3 is also amphoteric in nature. In case of group 14, the oxides of the lightest element carbon such as CO and CO2 are molecular oxides. There is another one called carbon suboxide, I will discuss about that one uh, again later. In contrast, SiO2 called silica is a polymeric oxide and CO2 is an acidic oxide again since it dissolves in water giving an acidic solution. For example, one can also write in the same way CO2 plus H2O gives H2CO3. In group 15 and 16, the oxides of nitrogen all are molecular covalent species, many of which are acidic, while those of sulfur are both acidic oxides, or again, if you consider SO2 or SO3, both are acidic in nature. Similarly, group 17 and for xenon in group 18, the oxides are essentially molecular species. Okay. So, let us just look into the last one in the series halides of these elements. Okay. S block halides are predominantly ionic, say NaCl, CaCl2, etc. The P block halides are predominantly covalent. In the D block, the lower oxidate halides tend to be ionic and high oxidate halides tend to be covalent. Similar to hydrates, the properties of the chlorides follow a broadly similar pattern with chlorides of metals being ionic and of non-metals being covalent molecules. For the group 1 and group 2 metals except beryllium, which has covalent character, the chlorides are ionic solids which form neutral solutions in water. The chlorides of small highly polarizing metal ions such as beryllium, aluminum, gallium and some other elements are polymeric in the solid state. The majority of the chlorides of group 14 and 15 elements and BCL3 all are molecular covalent species. The chlorides of P block elements and beryllium generally give acid solutions in water because they react with it rather than simply dissolving. And again CCL4 unlike SiCl4 does not react with water to give an acidic solution and this is purely kinetic effect. I would also discuss the difference in their reactivity when I go to group 14 and uh, some of the chlorides of the elements are listed here. You can see uh, alkali metals and alkaline earth metals will follow monochloro and dichloro species and whereas in case of uh, uh, group 13, you can see the lighter will form trihalides whereas the heavier ones uh, you can see in plus 2 as well as plus 1 state that means here in case of thallium chloride is stable, in fact thallium trichloride is oxidizing in nature. Some of these of course here the inert pair effect start coming into the picture. I again I will elaborate what is inert pair effect when you go to uh, P block chemistry. And similarly in, in most of the uh, P block elements when you go for heavier elements essentially higher halides are oxidizing in nature and they show uh, 2 or 3 different type of uh, uh, halides 
especially lead shows plus 2 and plus 4 and plus 2 is stable whereas plus 4 is oxidizing same thing is true in case of tin as well as uh, uh, antimony, antimony SpCl3 is stable, SpCl5 is unstable because the inert pair effect dominates same thing is true in case of BiCl3 and BiCl4 that means uh, overall now we looked into the three different type of compounds we come across among main group elements that is hydrides, oxides and then halides. The one more type of compound is essentially interaction of this most of these main group elements with carbon or organic fragments they are called organo element compounds. Those aspects I will be discussing as and when we come across this type of compounds and in my next lecture I will be elaborating little bit more before I go to the chemistry of hydrogen and then I will start group wise chemistry of uh, main group elements and uh, I hope uh, you have learned something about the classification and uh, uh, periodic trends and periodic properties and new terms such as ionization energy, ionization enthalpy and also electronic configuration. With this I will stop here. I wish you very happy reading and thank you very much. Vayam Prabha, Digital India, Educated India.